Welcome to Civil War Digital Digest. I'm Will. Well, I've not been many be more beautiful places in the United States of America than here. And I'm at Berkeley Plantation with Jamie Jameson, uh, third generation caretaker here, essentially. <laughs> Tell us the Civil War story here, Jamie. Well, uh, we start off uh, really here. Uh, this was the home of the Harrison family at that time a little after that they just had lost it due to the failure of tobacco, so the house was vacant. And during the Peninsula Campaign, uh, uh, General McClellan uh, was trying to come through and uh, take Richmond early on, the early years of the war, uh, 1862, and uh, met Lee and Jackson up at Seven Days Battle, and it didn't turn out the way he planned. <laughs> <laughs> so after, after that and the Battle of Malvern Hill, which is just up the road, he brought his 140,000 troops back here to Berkeley and uh, camped here. He wanted to be close to his big naval guns. He had supposedly 50 naval guns with big, big caliber weapons and that, and he felt safe there uh, from a counterattack from Lee and Jackson. We've got big names here. We've got McClellan. We've got the Harrison family we'll talk about in a bit, but that's huge in American history. Yes. We have the Jameson family here. Tell me your connection to this place. My grandfather, a Scottish immigrant, came to New York Harbor about a year before the Civil War. His name was John Jameson. And uh, he was here at Berkeley, uh, fought uh, at seven days, and then came back here to Berkeley with McClellan. Well, we've talked, you've mentioned the Harrisons briefly, and this is a grand plantation which had to be built, built beautifully. We do mostly Civil War, but you can't miss a story like this <laughs> when you come to visit. Take me to the beginning and let's hear what's going on here. Well, the place was settled in 1619 by the Barclay Company from Barclay Castle. We've Americanized that name to Berkeley now. And uh, that colony was about the fifth after Jamestown, 1619. And they had a colon, uh, stockade type fort down on the river. And uh, they uh, were here for about three years before there was an actual massacre by Obi-Kan Canoe, Powhatan's brother. And that kind of broke it up. Uh, so really, you go from there um, um, to a really uh, Nathaniel Bacon, who bought it uh, after that, before the Harrisons. And then you skip from there up to the Harrison family that owned it for seven generations and farmed tobacco here. Great. Well, there's certainly two names in the Harrison family we should talk about. Why don't you introduce us to both of them? Well, the actual uh, uh, Harrison, that the eldest son was always named Benjamin. And Benjamin the fourth purchased the property, and then Benjamin the fifth, his son, um, and they had built this house in 1726, and they also the two two abutting houses, and he was a member of the Continental Congress. He also signed the Declaration of Independence, and then later on, um, his descendants, uh, William Henry Harrison, old Tippy Canoe, <laughs> was president with John Tyler as his vice president, both from Charles City County. Well, it's interesting as we talk about connections in Civil War Digital Digest that my historic site at home, William Henry Harrison was at when working, making a treaty to end the War of 1812. Right. I come here and I see his picture in the drawing room. Right. Well, there's also a great Civil War story here that carries through to today. Briefly tell me the story of Taps. The story of Taps is an interesting one. It, uh, when uh, General McClellan uh, withdrew here to Berkeley and Westover in July and August of 1862, after meeting Lee and Jackson during the Seven Days Battle, which was a northern attempt to take Richmond early on in the war, uh, while he was sitting here for those two months, uh, one of his uh, generals, a General uh, Butterfield, uh, came up with a looking for a tune to, to blow at the evening uh, uh, that lights out and he came up with a tune taps and it was composed here uh, in, uh, in 1862. His bugle Oliver Norton first sounded taps here on the place and then it was later, the story goes, t picked up by the uh, rest of the regiments of the Northern Army. That became a call that was picked up by uh, the Southern forces as well and becomes one of the most familiar tunes in our history. Great, and when I visit Berkeley Plantation, how is it commemorated here? Uh, yes, there's a, a very nice monument overlooking. We up on a big hill overlooking the James River, two mile wide James River here. Well, as we talk about our growth as a country, there's a lot of positives, but there are challenges to our country as well. A building this big in Virginia in this era, 
there are enslaved peoples yes. here. Tell me the story. Well, the story really is the story uh, of economics. Um, they first successful after the initial failures at Jamestown of trying to grow silkworms and one thing or another, and they found that tobacco was very much in demand uh, in Europe and in England. And so these places were really built on the profits from tobacco, which was a, they called the golden leaf. And tobacco is a very labor intensive crop. It can't be raised any other way. And so they were enslaved persons here uh, that uh, helped in, in, in that endeavor and really were the background, the economic backbone of being able to build uh, these great houses. Great. Well, I know your family has taken some strong stances in public about helping to keep the conversation moving forward as a country. How do you approach working with the history of enslavement here? We embrace it, really. It, was, it, it, it is a part that can't be uh, ignored. We, we, uh, I personally think it was a, a, a very, very, very bad thing to enslave anyone. Uh, and you've been able to share some of the documents you found here. Talk to me a little bit about those briefly. Uh, yes, we've, we've done extensive research uh, trying to find out uh, the number we had uh, at one time, probably up to 100 slaves. We uh, tend, since our northern background and being Scottish immigrants, so tend to be very liberal in our views. And uh, we were very fortunate in about a year and a half ago, having almost the entire movie of Harriet filmed here on the place. The story must be told. It, it is a, a unfortunate story, but it, it is history. And um, I think the story needs to be told uh, good and bad, all parts of it. It needs to be understood. Uh, so we were very fortunate and we have reproductions rather of the slave quarters uh, that were used in Harriet and a lot of the artifacts that are here on the place so people can actually see, you know, as much as they can with paintings and other parts of our orientation, you know, how, what part the slaves played in it and how vital it was of, of a part to be played. Fantastic. Well, you mentioned being able to see some stuff. Talk to me. I come visit Berkeley. I get a friend of mine to come with me. What do we get to see here? Well, you get to see 350 years of history, starting with the 1619 history, and then you understand a little bit more how the plantations functioned, uh, how the politics developed with the Continental Congress and, and all down the, during these, uh, no, there were about five families in Virginia, the Harrisons, the Carters, and a few others that pretty well ran the show as far as government and economics. So you understand how that worked and how it was able to build these uh, very beautiful uh, buildings. This, this one here in our background was built in 1726. It took wow. three years to build and it's still all exactly in its standing with the uh, all the furnishings inside that a lot of people really seem to enjoy. They are actually uh, authentic uh, 18th century furnishings that it's uh, all they, with their, anything in the beautiful rooms. And then there's a, a museum in the basement that shows not only the 1619 period, but also extensive work on the Civil War. Uh, a lot of, uh, of the bugles that were used then and the all sorts of munitions that were found on the place. Tell me a little bit about your story. A Scottish immigrant's grandkid ends up owning a plantation. How, how does the Jameson family get here? Well, as I mentioned briefly before, my grandfather, and he was my grandfather, not my great-grandfather, was a drummer boy here in McClellan's Army. And then after the war, he survived, fought in all the battles, fought at Gettysburg. He went back, uh, he had a, a brother who was Walter Jameson, who uh, was a, a couple of years older than he was, and actually won the 22nd Congressional Medal of Honor for work, uh, things in heroic actions at Petersburg and, and also Fort Harrison. And they went back to New York and, and then took the next 40 years slowly coming from poverty to where he actually had a corporation that, uh, uh, construction that built the stat base of the Statue of Liberty and was getting ready to build some huge docks for the luxury liners in New York Harbor. And he remembered, he was 60 years old at that point, and remembered the wonderful stands of timber on the place when he was with McClellan 50 years before. And he wired Richmond and asked if the uh, timber was intact. And they said it was, and he bought it sight unseen for $26,000. And he came with my father, uh, Mac Jameson, Malcolm Jameson, uh, down here with uh, barges coming down the Hudson River, going through Chesapeake Bay and coming up the James to haul the timber back to New York. 
And what did your father think when he got here? Well, he was a young man and uh, in his teens, and he fell in love with the place. He'd grown up on Long Island, and uh, he always said that he'd seen enough concrete to last him the rest of his life. So he, he came down with grandfather and actually had to live in wall tents because the houses you see in the background here were uninhabitable. The roofs were falling in. They used them for grain storage, and they, you couldn't even live in them. So they lived in wall tents for five summers. And then grandfather suddenly died, and the family wanted to liquidate this property since they'd cut most of the timber off it. And my father, who was one of, of three children, four children, uh, uh, begged them to let him have a chance to see if he could restore it. And they all told him he was crazy. It would just always be a pit that he'd throw money into, would never be able to do it. So he and my mother, uh, who was a Richmond uh, social bell and knew a lot about decoration and antiques. They spent the rest of their lives, 65 years, slowly, piece by piece, with farm profits. They never had any money getting uh, the antiques together, the, the authentic antiques, and doing the restoration. So it was a, very much a labor of love. So I feel obligated to try to continue that story and to continue to have this. Our main joy is seeing tourists enjoy this place, understand a little more about Virginia history, about national history, and every now and then I'll be on the grounds and I'm very active. I'm still, I'm 77 years old, but I'm still out here on tractors and having one of them stopped and said, we've enjoyed ourselves so much. It was just so peaceful and we learned so much. That's what makes it worthwhile. Well, you've got a team of us here today who have <laughs> helped you achieve that goal. I, absolutely stunning. Thank you for sharing it with us. Well, it was my pleasure and I've, I've enjoyed it and I appreciate what you're doing uh, to keep history alive. Well, thank you. We'll keep on trying. You stay here, God willing, and we'll send some people your way. And you need to get here to Berkeley Plantation. The photographs and the video only do it so much justice. McClellan spent a month here. Come spend an afternoon. Walk around the ground, see the place. History from the Civil War that we're passionate about to other time periods in American history. You find that connection right here at Berkeley Plantation. See you next time.